Now, next question is, what is the sign of his coming? Because remember, they, they said to him three days before he was going to die, they said, what's the sign of your coming? What's the end of the age? He's already answered the end of the age and earlier. Now he's going to answer the sign of his coming. Jesus answered the end of the age question already. The next he answers the sign of his coming question in verse 14, in 14 more verses. And by verse 28, he's explained the conditions on the ground immediately prior to his coming. So he's, you know, they, you've got to picture them sitting on the Mount of Olives. He just told them a little while ago, all the temple buildings are going to be destroyed. And that was a shocker to them. And then he told them that he was going to, he was going to be in Jerusalem, he was going to die. And so they're, they're going, okay, this stuff's getting serious, so why don't you answer some questions for us? So after he answers the two questions, he begins the 66 extra verses and launches into three big critical keys for faithful servant survival. Now, <clears throat> if we were all soldiers in boot camp, we would be trained how to use weapons. We'd be how, trained how to keep our helmet on our head. We'd be trained in staying alive. And that's what Jesus is doing in Matthew 24 and 25. He's saying, I'm going to be dead in three days. I'm going to leave the planet. And what I need you faithful servants to do is be really focused on staying faithful to your last breath. So for now, we're looking at the sign of his coming section, Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, <clears throat> I have explained this in detail in other videos, but simply put, a study of the desolate word. The clue is, if you want to do a study, study the desolate word in the book of Daniel. It's not just in one or two places, it's in multiple places. So if you study the abomin the desolate word, pretty soon you're going to see that the abominable desolator person, the one who desolates, is the 666 beast person of Revelation. God's given us a clue in Revelation and he uses certain names and terminology. He's given us clues in Daniel 11, king of the south, I'm um, king of the north, in other places, Paul calls him the man of perdition. He's, he's called multiple names, and one of the names it comes over to us the way it's translated as the abomination of desolation. But if you study Daniel, you can see that it means more than that. It means abominable desolator person, the one who desolates Jerusalem. So Matthew 24:16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, get out of town, because the abomination is now, the abomination person is set up in the holy place, he claims to be God. Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything from his house, leave immediately. Let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes or cloak. Pray that your flight, when you flee to the mountains, may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Verse 21 says, For then will be great tribulation, so, when, when does the tribulation begin? Very shortly after the, the, the morning and evening sacrifices are stopped on the same day as the abominable person is set up in the holy place as, as I am God. He, he announces to the world that he is God, the Christ of the Bible. And by then, most people are so spiritually drunk, they say, yay, who can make war with the beast? And so on. So, Great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world until that time or ever shall be. It's the worst time in human history. Verse 22, unless those days should be shortened, no flesh will be saved. For the elect's sake, they shall be shortened. So the abomin abominable, desolated person will claim to be Christ, Messiah on earth, which on a normal day, you'd say, that's insane, that can't possibly be. How could any human fake it to where it's credible to humans on earth, Bible-toting humans, 
that he is actually the Christ. Well, Satan is given permission for three and a half years to give this person, this abominable, desolated person, superpowers. And so, and God has given permission to Satan to give the beast power superpowers. And in a little bit we'll see he sends strong, God himself sends strong delusion. Why would he do that? Because if you don't believe the truth, you're going to believe the lie. And this, you're going to have this fork in the road. We already know it, we believe it, but if we become offended and we hate one another and we, you know, we turn away, then we're going to be on the wrong side of the equation here. So he says, um, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you, Paul writes, by any means, for that day, the coming of Christ, will not come unless there's a falling away first. Now, why would there be a falling away before the coming of Christ? Because people are getting hated for agreeing with the two witnesses preaching this gospel into all the world, and therefore they don't want to be hated so therefore they capitulate. They, they say, well, I'm, I'm just going to worship the beast power and accept the mark of the beast so I don't have to die, right? There'll be a falling away comes first and the man of sin, the son of perdition will be revealed, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Now, I don't know that we've, any of us have experienced this. I've watched a couple of Hitler's movies from World War II where Hitler didn't tell the German people I am God! He didn't say that. But he sure acted like it. <laughs> right? And he would have thousands upon thousands of people all going Zeke! Hell! Zeke! Hell! You know, and his moustache and he's standing up there as pompous as all get out and I am the Führer and I am the, I'm almost a God person. But he doesn't sit in the, in the holy place in Jerusalem and he doesn't say, I am God. God has reserved that until the last three and a half years and the abomination, the desolation and so on. So he exalts himself above all that is called God and worships and he sits as God in the holy place, says temple, but it can mean just holy place of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, the antidote for believing that he is God is reading this stuff ahead of time and knowing that he's coming first. And that the real one comes riding on a white horse followed by a whole bunch of angels riding on white horses and they come down from the high heavens to the clouds. And when they get to the clouds, the dead people, the dead in Christ, rise up and they meet Jesus in the clouds and all of this is visible. And that's when the real Jesus comes not secretly, as Jesus warns them, don't believe the secret coming of Christ. Jesus warns against this greatest deception for planet Earth, soon to come on the scene, Matthew 24, 23. And, and then if he says to you, look, here is the Christ, the Christ. What does the Christ mean? The Christ means the anointed one, the holy one, the return of Jesus, the Messiah, the Naz Jesus of Nazareth, right? When they tell you, this is the Christ, he says, don't believe that. It won't be me. It'll be a fake Christ, right? If anyone says, look, here is the Christ, right? Um, do not believe it, right? Verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets, teachers, will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, if the elect get offended by being hated of all nations, they can be deceived. If you let yourself be deceived, you can be deceived, right? And, and so, you know, Jesus, right? Jesus, with three days to left to live, is spending 66 extra verses to say, pull out all the stops to prepare and defend yourself against this unbelievable, incredible deception, right? Now, this is based on there's a good chance you might live into the tribulation. Chester didn't. 
We didn't know Chester wasn't going to live into the tribulation, right? But, but if we find ourselves alive when the abomination of desolation is set up in the holy place and the morning and evening sacrifices are stopped, guess what? We're about to be alive in the tribulation and all of this stuff will be coming down. And if we are alive, we need to have this stuff in our heads to protect ourselves from deception. So this is his warning to prepare our brains against the super powerful end time deception. 2 Thessalonians 2.11 for this reason, and you could argue, hey God, this is not fair. Right? Except when God does something, it's fair. Right? For this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Right? Why would God want to send anybody strong delusion? To divide everybody up into two camps. You either believe the truth and you stay faithful until the end in God's camp, or you get offended at God's truth if you knew it. Right? And you end up in the other camp that worships the beast and follows the beast power until the return of Christ. So God will send strong delusions that they should believe the lie. And what is the great lie? Is that this human person, king of the north, number three, the abominable desolator person, the son of perdition, who shows himself that he is God, the lie is... If you accept and believe that he is Jesus Christ, you just believe the lie. God allows this great deception to get undecided people off the fence. So right now we've got millions of undecided people on the planet. Right? Two billion follow Jesus, the Sunday Jesus, the Christmas Jesus. Right? A small number follow the seventh day Sabbath Jesus. Right? And all the other billions and billions of people follow all kinds of other stuff or nothing. Or, you know, they're atheists or whatever it is. So he's going to get everybody off the fence. They're going to be in either one or two camps based on unbelievable miracles and signs and wonders and so on and false preaching. So they will, he wants to get them off the fence so they will fully commit to A, either the lawless Christ or reject the lawless Christ and wait for the coming of the true Christ, right? Which he has given us ample information about of how that's going to be. This section of Matthew 24 is the Jesus warning to mentally prepare us against the great deception. In verse 25, he says, Jesus speaking, you know, those who were sitting there on the mountain with him looked in his face, and he looked in their face, and he said, See, I've told you beforehand. And of course they wrote it down, and 2,000 years worth of Jesus following people have read, See, I have told you before it happens how it's going to happen. You are already given the information how it's come. Now, most people out there in the world who even read their Bible, they don't have a clue how it's going to happen. And they're all being taught, two billion of them are being taught. Don't worry, you little head. Because the first thing that happens is, all the good Jesus people are raptured off the planet. <laughs> so you're not even here during the tribulation. So why should you worry your little head about these facts and figures? <clears throat> when, and Jesus says, you know, there is no rapture. <laughs> There's a falling away, yes, but there is no rapture. And people will be on the planet until the seventh trumpet and the coming of Jesus Christ and the battle of Armageddon. So, in, uh, in verse 26 of Matthew 24, Therefore, if they say to you, because they will be saying, Look, he's in the desert. Do not go out into the desert to check it out. I, Jesus, have told you beforehand, no matter what they say about, he's here, he's here. Don't believe it. Because the real he, me, hasn't come riding on a white horse yet, so don't believe it. Okay, the rest of the verse, 26. For look, he's in the inner rooms. He's in secret. He's come to the earth and he's in secret. Right? Jesus says, do not believe it. Right? Jesus is saying, have nothing to do with it because it's a total hoax, a fake human Christ impersonator. Now, we're all familiar with Elvis impersonators, right? How many of you think one of those Elvis impersonators might actually be Elvis? <laughs> Elvis is dead, folks. That's it. Sorry. But there's a lot of Elvis impersonators. We're going to have a Jesus Christ impersonator supported by Satan the devil and every trick he's got in his arsenal, right? And Jesus is, 
God the Father is contributing to this by sending strong delusion by giving Satan permission for three and a half years to pour out the deception on the whole planet. Because you get a choice. You either stay faithful, and if you die or stay alive in the tribulation, then you go into the kingdom and you live for all eternity in God's family. Right? Or if you reject, if you're offended, if the falling away is part of what you do, then you end up going full scale, full, full cycle, and you come back up in the second resurrection. I can show you scripture on that. I don't think it's in the notes. but All right. Jesus urges us to wait until we see the white horses. Right? If, if we can remember nothing else, right? we've got to wait out like a four-year period at least, or close to it, where, have you seen the white horses yet? And you won't have to ask anybody, right? Because everybody on the planet is going to see the white horses. Most of them won't know what the white horses is. It's like, now, we're supposed to know what the white horses is. It's Jesus and the angels coming down to the clouds for the first resurrection to meet the saints in the clouds and then go over to Jerusalem. Revelation 19, 11. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Oh, who could that be? The real Jesus. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Who does he make war with? He makes war with the beast power. Right? Is he going to win? <laughs> Absolutely. Read Zechariah 14. He wins in a heartbeat sort of thing. Right? Okay, in verse 12. His eyes are like a flame of fire, another description of Jesus from other parts of the Bible, and on his head was many crowns. Verse 13, he was clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Oh, who could that be? That would be Jesus. Revelation 19, 14, the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So, what can you expect to see if you wait and you don't accept the false fake Christ impersonator, right? If you wait for the seventh trumpet and you wait for the actual coming of Jesus Christ, your first clue will actually be, if you're able to see it, the sky scrolling back and people seeing the Father on the throne and the Lamb of God. But pretty quickly after they see that, the Lamb will get on a white horse and begin descending, followed by how, you know, how many billions, gazillions of angels, I don't know. But you won't be able to see the sun, so the bright activity of that day will be the white horses. Right? That's the real coming of Christ. And you, can, you know, believe it because you've read it in your Bibles and you've studied it and he's warned you don't accept a Christ until you see one coming on the white horses. So this is the first proof of the true coming of Jesus, Matthew 24, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Okay, there's another clue, right? When the, when the fake Christ is introduced and sits in the temple and shows himself as his God, are all the tribes of the earth going to mourn at that time? No. They're going to accept him as, hey, Jesus is here, hallelujah, praise God, right? So they won't be mourning. So when you see all the tribes of the earth mourning at the white horses, <laughs> right? This is the real thing, right? So the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Okay, where, where are the clouds? Well, sometimes they're real low, but in most cases they're up there a couple of thousand feet. And you, and you can look, you know, look up there and there's the clouds. Um, you get in the airplane, you can fly up there. What's really great is you fly on a rainy day like today, and once you get to 30,000 feet, which is just above the cloud level, maybe on, the, on a rainy day, right? Suddenly the plane goes up through the clouds, and everything above the clouds is bright sunshine. And everything below the clouds is just like we're experiencing now, rainy, dreary day, right? Okay, so he says, coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. So all of humanity will see this, but most will reject because they already have Christ, the beast power. So they're going to reject whatever comes after they've accepted the false Christ. And they'll reject whatever this is. And we've already been told in movies a hundred times, right? Aliens are coming to get us from Mars, right? Or from someplace in the, out in the universe 
the evil eat those human people aliens are going to come down to earth and eat us right and so we got to destroy them now how do we destroy aliens that are coming to earth on white horses well with any means possible right and i'll guarantee you they'll launch some air-to-air -air missiles right or ground-to-air missiles they'll they'll launch a whole bunch of stuff at these guys riding the white horses guys and gals whatever you know basically basically they're then they're neutral, right? But anyhow, Jesus still is seen as a guy. Um, they come riding on the, on the white horses, and the beast power sends his weaponry to destroy it, and that isn't successful, and Jesus lands his feet on the Mount of Olives, splits the Mount of Olives, takes over the city of Jerusalem. The beast power says, we've got to go down there and kill that thing by hook or by crook. We've got to do that. And so Jesus helps them, dries up the river Euphrates, they hurry their troops across the river Euphrates. They come down to Armageddon, Tel Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel, and they get all organized. And then they launch the attack from that point, and they're headed down towards Jerusalem. And as they get near Jerusalem, fire comes down from heaven, and a great panic occurs, and they turn their weapons on each other. And you end up with uh, like <clears throat> the Gog and Magog situation where the enemies of Israel lie dead on the mountains of Israel. And they're gathering and burying their bones for like seven years, uh, seven months after the war. And they're using the weaponry, the wood out of the weaponry, for fires for seven years. So that's Ezekiel 37, 38, uh, 38 and 39. That's really good stuff. All right, so um, <clears throat> then we come to verse 28. And, oh, verse 27. And this is poorly translated. It says, for as lightning... But it should say the dawning. Okay, if you go out before sunrise and you see brightness in the sky, is that north, south, east, or west? Where does the sun come up? East. Okay, does it always come up in the east? Has it ever come up someplace else? It always comes up in the east, right? So what he's saying is, for as the lightning or the dawning of the day comes from the east, which is where the sun rises, right? And they put in flashes, but it can mean shines, and shines towards the west. Okay, where does the sun set? In the west. So, obviously, for 6,000 years, people have been watching the morning, east, brightening, dawning of coming of the day, and then it goes into the high noon, and then it goes into the west, and where does the sun disappear? In the west, right? So he says, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And earth will be rotating towards the east, as it always does and has. And Jesus will be coming down from heaven. And you, it will appear to anybody and everybody on the planet as the earth rotates that this brightness is coming up from the east, which is what he just said. Verse 28. And this is poorly translated too. It says, For wherever the carcass is or body, there the eagles, and Vine's Expository Dictionary says, it should have been translated vultures. Now for 6,000 years, whenever people have looked up in the sky and seen six or eight vultures circling, what do they know? What do you know? Right? What's down underneath the circling vultures? A dead body, the carcass. That's you know, it's just as as common and as obvious to as it always has been for people throughout six thousand years. So that's what he's saying. It, where the body, where Christ's body is, there, you know, you're going to see the gathering of the body of Christ right there, up there in the clouds, right above you. It's going to be, it won't be secretive, it'll be very clear and very obvious. And if you're a faithful servant, you'll be up there with the body, right? And you won't have to worry about vultures, because this is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. So, um, in 28 verses, Jesus has answered to the two questions and given them stern warning against being deceived. The great thing that he dwells on and repeats, and the very first thing he said in verse 4, do not be deceived. Then he says it multiple times throughout Matthew 24, Matthew 25. Do not be deceived. Right? Why? Because there's incredible great deception coming. So 
Um, he gives certain warnings against being deceived. Then Jesus gives 66 extra verses explaining in detail the three ways to be totally ready to meet Jesus. So the positive approach to faithful servant survival, whether we die in the next month or two, which we could, I could, most of us probably won't, but we could. Uh, we don't know the hour of the day. I'm going to be driving home in the rain. You know, there's lots of dangerous circumstances driving home in the rain. Okay, so it's made very clear in the three parables that are given to us in Matthew 25. The, the wise virgins, the talents parable, and the sheep and the goats. These are three big, long, powerful parables, but they're all saying the same thing. Be ready to meet your maker at, what, at whatever hour or whatever day it happens to be. For 2,000 years, it's happened over 2,000 years for a lot of people, and if you're alive in the, in the tribulation and you make it to the end of the tribulation, you still won't know the day or the hour, but you'll have a really good idea of what season it is when you see the two witnesses lying in the street. But first, he had to answer their questions about the sign of his coming.